A woman's body is found in a house fire. She's been raped and murdered. He set fire to Lisa's bedroom. Her 80-year-old mother has been left for dead. He got a vacuum cord and he wrapped it around her neck. The suspected killer is serial sex offender Leroy Campbell. He's been released from prison just four months earlier after serving 16 years for a violent sexual attack. Campbell has warned his probation officers that he wants to rape again, but no one pays any attention. Leroy Campbell is a serial sex offender and rapist who has spent more than half his life in prison. How was this vicious predator allowed to roam the streets again and commit this atrocious crime? One in five murders in the UK is now committed by an ex-prisoner. From serial rapists... He harboured dark thoughts about carrying out sexual offences. ..to convicted killers. They'd met in prison. They were out on the streets together. Free to walk amongst us. They knew he could have killed again. Free to murder innocent people. She stabbed him many times, and then she hid him in a wheelie bin. I'm Donald McIntyre and I'm examining how such tragedies happen. Who's to blame? Is it the justice system? Or are these killers just pure evil? She gained pleasure from hurting people. And ultimately, could an innocent life have been saved? This is Release to Kill. Leroy Campbell is born in 1961 in Birmingham, England's third largest city. The son of Jamaican immigrants. Leroy Campbell, it would appear, had a successful and happy childhood and uh, the family were comfortably off. In later life, he discloses he was sexually abused by a relative who came to stay. Leroy Campbell said that he was abused as a child, and it, it sounds as though it wasn't a, a short-term level of abuse, but something that went over a significant amount of time. It's not that uncommon that within a, a caring and loving environment that somebody is taken advantage of by um, an adult. It's a bit like a, a ticking time bomb that's in there, and it will go off at some point, that if this has happened in their childhood, sooner or later, that person is going to react to, to what happened to them um, in their adult life. The majority of people who have experienced trauma and abuse in their childhoods do not go on to abuse. But I often find that individuals who have gone on to commit offences, and particularly very serious offences, have a significant history of trauma in their past. In his teens, Campbell becomes a regular cannabis user and would remain so all his life. Some studies suggest a real link between early use of cannabis and going on to um, demonstrate problematic behaviour. But there's not really a clear consensus on this. We do know that at that age, the brains are still developing, so it makes sense that using any kind of um, intoxicating substance would impact on the brain development. In his late teens, Campbell starts the only intimate relationship he will ever have and fathers two children. But in 1983, age 22, that relationship comes to an end when he's convicted of his first sexual offence. In 1983, he'd broken into a house and had um, tried to choke um, a nurse, actually, who lived there with the intent to rape her. Campbell receives a seven-year sentence for this assault, which already bears the hallmarks of the violent sexual offending that would follow. I think the fact that Campbell got seven years shows that it's not typical, because a, a typical rape offence would attract a sentence of maybe around five years. So the fact that it was seven years would imply to me that there was more force or more threats or something more was going on. In the late 80s, Campbell is released from prison, having served just half his sentence. He's now back in Birmingham and on the prowl. Decades later, it's revealed the police suspect him of many more sexual assaults in the 1980s. But there's never enough evidence to charge him. 
The next attack, which police can prove he committed, comes in 1991. This time, his sexual offending is even more brutal than before. He broke into a house again, and he repeatedly raped uh, a woman in the house uh, while her five-year-old son was in the property. Campbell climbs through a window while the woman is asleep with her child. He disguises his appearance with a T-shirt over his head and a pair of rubber gloves. Then, wielding a knife, he attacks. Police catch up with him later that day after matching his shoes to imprints left outside the woman's house. Seven months later, Campbell appears in Birmingham Crown Court where he pleads guilty. He is sentenced to 10 years in prison. When I first started in, in, in 1990s, anyone who was convicted of, of rape um, had to be kept separate. It was, it, was, it was a completely frowned upon. Nowadays, it's just an accepted crime. You know, you would have sex offenders on one unit um, because they have to be protected from other prisoners. But there's also a positive development. His sentence coincides with the introduction of the Sex Offender Treatment Programme, one of the many rehabilitation programmes that Campbell will participate in over the coming years. These would not be short programmes. They would, they would last over many weeks, and uh, it would be an opportunity for the psychologist or whoever ran that particular programme to, uh, to make him think about the impact and the effect of his uh, sexual offending on the victims. He knew that this was something that uh, he would need to tick off in order to uh, get closer to a release date. For this, his second sexual conviction, Campbell serves only six years. He's released in June 1998. At 30, Campbell is now registered as a sex offender for life. He's now been convicted of two serious sexual assaults. But were there any warning signs of what was to come? And could he have been stopped after his first offence? Probation consultant Adrian Smith and forensic psychiatrist Professor Taj Nathan are with me in the Crime Hub to discuss the case. It seems to be the go-to excuse for sex offenders to say that they were abused as a child. What percentage of uh, those people who claim it actually were? There are lots of people who commit sex offences who have been abused, but I, I think it's worth looking at it from the, the other perspective. Most people who've experienced childhood abuse of one sort or another don't sexually offend. So, it may be relevant, but it's not the primary causal factor. So before his very first offence, he was taking his cannabis out with the boys, travelling with a bit of the wrong crowd, as well as having uh, a couple of kids and being in a long-term relationship. This isn't presenting as somebody who is going to be a future sex offender. Uh, no, I'd agree. So that sort of profile wouldn't flag up any concerns about the potential for such serious sexual offending as this. Now, in terms of his first attack, what kind of resources are there for them in trying, trying to, in terms of treatment uh, and treating uh, a sex offender, particularly a young f sex offender? This is going back to the 80s, and the sex offender treatment program in the prisons hadn't been developed at that stage. So the, the extent to which he would have been offered anything in terms of rehabilitation, in terms of any, uh, a program, uh, is, is frankly quite limited. So following his previous attempted rape, he's released put back in the community, probation. To all intents and purposes, it's going well. And then he commits a similar but very vicious crime, and it is rape, and he's convicted again. We now have a pattern. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, we can say we have a pattern. There are two offences for which he's been convicted of, but there is also a strong possibility that there may be other offence offences that have uh, that have, that uh, for which he's avoided detection. Naturally, the stigma attached to uh, sex offenders within the prison estate is uh, pretty heavy, uh, as you'd expect. How is that managed, and how would that impact upon the inmate? He would be protected and, and will be with other offenders who have committed similar types of offences or offences that are, and, uh, have a high disapproval rating amongst the other inmates. The risk of that, of course, is you find yourself with offenders who are like-minded um, associating together, and that, that, that can be a dangerous process. So here we are. He's been through probation. He commits another offence. He's back in prison. I mean, just 
just how sophisticated were the treatment programs dealing with a serious sexual offender like this at the time? Those would be either individual therapy sessions or group, group therapy sessions, uh, which would try to understand the thoughts and emotions that uh, underpin the offending so that the offender can then attempt to deal with those and respond in different ways to those thoughts and emotions. Within the therapeutic setting, uh, I've seen sex offenders and they tend to, you know, inherit all the medical terms, the uh, therapeutic terms, and give them back. And it seems to me as if they're kind of not taking full responsibility for their actions, treating their offending as a condition rather than as something as a crime. Yeah, so, so I would agree with that. And I suppose the second point is, um, how the therapist could distinguish between the offender who is rehearsing the words without having the emotional experience underneath the words. And that can be very difficult to detect because without the emotional correlates of the uh, thoughts, then the therapy is unlikely to be effective. By the time he's 30, Leroy Campbell has been convicted of two violent sexual assaults and police suspect him of many more. This serial sex offender is now released to go back onto our streets. Leroy has convinced the experts that make up the parole board that his risk of re-offending can be managed in the community. He will have had to have done exactly the same things as, as everybody else does, so admit guilt, address offending behaviour, um, and he will have to, to demonstrate that to see what risk he still is. Campbell's a registered sex offender back in the community, but it's not long before he's out hunting for his next victim. Although Campbell is now firmly on probation's radar, they lose touch with him just seven months after his release, when he fails to turn up for appointments. This has dreadful consequences when he commits yet another terrifying sexual attack. He broke into a house in Wolverhampton and attacked a French au pair girl uh, who, was, who was working there. The family were away. She was sleeping on the settee downstairs. He got in through a ground floor window, went upstairs, blacked out the window with a duvet cover, put a pair of tights on his head to disguise himself and put on her dressing gown. After preparing the scene and donning his disguise, Campbell goes downstairs and waits for the au pair to wake up. And when she woke, he was sitting beside her with her dressing gown on and holding a knife. He dragged her upstairs, um, he sexually assaulted her, and then he forced her to have a cold bath to remove any DNA evidence from her. He then holds the traumatised young woman captive, but she manages to escape out of the back door and raise the alarm. Campbell flees the crime scene and escapes the country on a flight to Jamaica. Meanwhile, his probation officers search for him in vain. He would certainly have been in breach seriously of all the conditions that would have been around for him. And the uh, immediate result of that would have been that a warrant would have been issued for his arrest. Little is known about Campbell's disappearance. The following year, he returns to the UK and the police are waiting. They arrest him and Campbell admits the sexual assault on the au pair. Campbell is convicted of attempted rape and false imprisonment and is given an indeterminate sentence with a minimum of five years to serve. This means he can be held indefinitely until the authorities no longer consider him a serious risk to the public. The judge had said in that case that Campbell was a danger to women and that he hadn't learned any lessons from his past crimes, which had been almost facsimiles of this one. Leroy Campbell is back behind bars. A clear pattern is now emerging. Can this man ever be rehabilitated? And here we are with his third uh, sexual attack, for which the police want him for. And this is a choreography. He's elevated this into some kind of you know, demonic choreography. I mean, it's incredibly ornate, this attack. That process leading up to the offence can be seen as akin to foreplay. So that's the 
exciting preparation uh, that is part uh, that he requires to gain the maximum satisfaction from the offence itself. Yes, it seems a, de a deviant sexual fantasy is driving him, and it's understanding that. And I, I suspect at the time uh, that wasn't necessarily understood by the probation service. So he's blacking out his windows, he's putting stockings over his head, and he's, you know, nearly pre uh, preparing this stage for his sexual attack. Yes, and, and those are the necessary components as far as he's concerned to achieve the maximum satisfaction from the final offending behavior. But it's not just the offense, it's uh, likely to be the fact that he is invading someone's property and that he's engaged in other acts um, which uh, are associated as far as he's concerned with a sense of power and dominance. So rather than randomly wait around a corner and rape somebody in an alley, he's dominating the crime scene, he's yes. planning, he's dominating the room and dominating the victim. Yes, and, and I think this is, there can be confusion about whether this type of offender has psychopathic traits. Um, psychopathic traits are where the individual the offender doesn't understand the emotions of the, the other. In this case, it's the polar opposite. He wants to experience the emotion of the victim, but he wants that to be humiliation and degradation. It's going to be necessary to spend a, a significant amount of time getting behind the behaviour, talking to, the, to, to Campbell about why, why he does what he does. I suspect he's not clear himself about what he's doing at this stage. As time goes on and as the pattern emerges, I think the prognosis for rehabilitation becomes more pessimistic. We might have thought he might have had other sexual uh, um, crimes for which he wasn't convicted, but it's getting worse. Yes. So if you're analysing him there after his third offence, would you be very concerned that this might escalate even further? You might imagine that the cruel suffering inflicted upon the victim might become more pronounced, more profound, might elevate into murder. Absolutely. So um, if the suffering of the victim, the degradation of the victim is a key component of the offence that, that allows him to achieve sexual satisfaction, that could lead to a fatality. Campbell starts his sentence in HMP Manchester, a Category A prison. He continues to participate in sex offender treatment programmes. So for violent offenders, for sex offenders, you're looking at a group treatment programme. Um, it's cost effective and historically it's been seen as quite effective, but more and more we are thinking that these programmes don't have any significant impact on the likelihood of reducing reoffending. He also undertook one-to-one -one therapy regarding uh, sexual abuse that he had suffered as a child. So one of the main drivers for Leroy Campbell was about the sexual abuse and how he felt about it. And it's clear from his descriptions that he enjoys them feeling powerless, feeling denigrated, and that he recalls feeling those feelings as a child himself. Probation officers provide reports to the parole board that say Campbell should be considered as a level three risk, the highest level. This means that if they do release him, he will need maximum monitoring under the multi-agency public protection arrangement known as MAPA. This involves a number of key organisations, not just police and probation, social services, housing, psychology, education, uh, employment, all these organisations would be part of those MAPA meetings when that case is discussed. Campbell is denied parole three times in a row. On his fourth attempt, they still don't release him, but instead send him to HMP Dovegate a Category B therapeutic prison where his offending behaviour can be treated more effectively. This means that the therapy is happening 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are expected to um, take an active part in the community that you live in. You are involved in this decision-making process. You're essentially being reparented and reintroduced into a pro-social society. But this is costly and it takes time. Campbell spends nearly three years at HMP Dovegate and is reported to be making some progress. Whilst in prison, he is treated as MAPA Level 1, but his probation officer warns that that would rise to Level 2 or 3 on the outside. 
Finally, three years later, he's moved to North Sea Camp, a Category D open prison where inmates are typically prepared for release and can spend some time outside the prison. And I think that uh, there was perhaps um, a view that when he was in the prison and he was going on these courses and then he was sent to open prison, that it started a process that inevitably was going to lead to him being released. Leroy Campbell is now in the lowest category of prison, a CAT-D, or open prison. But how can the parole board be certain he's ready for life on the outside and isn't a risk to the public? At this stage, it's clear that everybody recognises that he's a serious risk to the public. And um, even within the prison system, um, he's being denied parole. I think it is evident at this stage that, that he is a risk. I think the authorities are recognising that. There are a series of parole reviews when the evidence is considered and the conclusion is that he is not eligible for release and to begin with, not even eligible for transfer to a less secure prison which then leads on to a decision to look at a therapeutic community uh, at Dovegate. The therapeutic prisons, uh, and there are few enough of them, they are pretty well regarded. I, I think that's true, and uh, he would have certainly been uh, going through a, a programme for sex offenders. The act of going through a therapeutic unit does show a willingness to change. On the other hand, it may be a smart guy playing the system. Well, it, it could be seen in either way, of course, and, and these things should be tested out effectively within the therapeutic community. You want this therapeutic community to be successful. You want this rehabilitative attempt to work. If all the reports are relatively positive, you probably end up in open, uh, open conditions, and then there's an opportunity to test out your behavior in that environment. He's regarded from the court records as being a person who's potentially uh, uh, a threat to the public for the rest of his life, but he's now being moved on this trajectory for release into the community, into a Category D prison. What happens in that Category D prison to prepare him for release? The biggest event is, of course, that quite often in these prisons there's no wall around the prison. There might be a fence, but it's, it's technically possible to walk out of the, of the gate at any given time, and that does test offenders, particularly those who've been institutionalised for some while. But there's also an opportunity to start rotel release on temporary leave. And of course, you're closely monitored during that process. Um, but it's the first uh, opportunity to test someone out in the community. Only the most dangerous of prisoners will never, ever be released. So is there a sense that the health and the prison professionals and probation professionals are kind of, you know, on that trajectory and then they're looking for evidence to inform that trajectory to kind of support their ultimate release? Uh, potentially, I think that's the case. And there's sometimes an inevitable move towards um, uh, open conditions. And I think the decision to move through the system rather than it being almost an inevitability, and there's some suggestion that was the case here, um, should be informed by a very thorough, detailed understanding of what's going on in his mind. And I'm not sure that that uh, was achieved. Leroy Campbell has served 16 years of his indeterminate sentence, far more than his minimum tariff of five years. He will soon be released again, but is it safe to do so? In 2015, Leroy Campbell starts day releases into the community. Everything seems to go well, and the following year, he is back before the parole board, where he finally meets with success. Before his release, Campbell should have a new MAPA risk assessment. But astonishingly, it's never carried out. Despite his previous serious offending history, he is simply treated as a level one risk. I think the tragedy of this case is he was seen as a MAPA level one, and that, that meant that uh, most of the responsibility fell on the probation service to supervise him. Now, I think he should have been at least a two or possibly a three. In July 2016, Leroy Campbell is released on parole licence and placed in a probation hostel in Bilston, Wolverhampton.
Bilston is a very much a working class area. Uh, it's a vibrant area, it's diverse, you've got people from different backgrounds living there. Typical English working class town. It's an area which is new to Leroy Campbell, but he seems to be settling in very well and making positive progress with his probation officer. The decision is taken to move him to a less restrictive hostel about 19 miles away in Moseley, Birmingham. He was moved to Moseley, so he'd be closer to his family. He had regular meetings with the probation service, the police as well, um, who monitored his psychological state. But although he's now living in his home area of Moseley, for some reason, he continues to visit the Bilston area. It's felt that he visited Bilston several times while he was staying in Moseley um, with the intent of looking for a victim. That is what is generally felt. And um, he, he found one. At the same time, his psychological state is dangerously deteriorating. He had a son in Birmingham and a daughter as well, but he didn't have that much contact with them at the time and he was feeling down. So, yeah, he was in a dark place. And having thoughts of reoffending again, and he gave himself two weeks to get over these thoughts or reoffend again. Three months after his release, Campbell had a meeting with his probation officer, during which he disclosed some crucial information. This is not his regular probation officer who was on annual leave, but a cover officer who was less familiar with the case. Leroy openly confesses that he's having thoughts of wanting to rape again. He told probation that the feelings were coming back, that he wanted to commit burglary and rape again. They gave him some contact numbers, one of the, which was the Samaritans. He originally said he was worried about his mental health and then went on to explicitly state that he was worried that he was going to rape somebody. And he did this on a number of occasions, including by telephone. He was really trying desperately to reach out and his information that he was given was essentially discounted. Despite the fact that Campbell is a three times convicted sex offender, Neither the cover probation officer nor their supervisor take the disclosure seriously enough. A review would later find that probation should either have moved Leroy back to the Bilston hostel and conduct a new MAPA assessment or have recalled him back to prison. They do neither. Leroy's explicit thoughts of rape are not even recorded. Campbell also tells the police he's thinking of reoffending. But again, his disclosures fall on deaf ears. Leroy Campbell has confessed to having dark thoughts about reoffending. Surely he should have been immediately recalled back to prison. For one positive, it did appear that the legacy of the therapy and the therapeutic prison was working to some degree. Uh, yes, there certainly is an indication of that, in that he reported to his probation officer that he was struggling and that he was having uh, thoughts of uh, committing another offence. So he's having dark thoughts and he now understood that he represented a danger uh, to others and confessed it. He confessed it and then it's an issue of how the probation service respond to that confession. At one level, it does suggest that he has moved forward in identifying the risk factors that, are, that exist. He's shared that. So perhaps perversely, the reaction might be, this is a good sign. On the other hand, if he was immediately recalled to prison, which they were entitled to do when he was self-confessing this serious risk, it would represent a punishment for the confession, which would perhaps make it even more dangerous because ultimately he would be released. That's not a reason not to recall him. That If he's informed in advance that uh, he would be encouraged to disclose if he is getting those thoughts, but he shouldn't uh, feel that it is a surprise if he gets recalled. But if he's on board and he sees that as part of his risk management plan rather than as a punishment, so it's the way that it's communicated both in advance uh, and afterwards. So that disclosure normally, when the system works well, who would share that information? What should have happened at the very least is a, a MAPA meeting should have been called to discuss the disclosure and to consider what the implications of that should be. Somewhere along the line, the importance uh, of, of the message 
seem to have been lost. Inevitably, when things like this happen, everyone blames breakdown in communication. What is happening here? Why did the system fail in this respect? Uh, I think people were on holiday. So people were on leave, people were not informed at the right moment. So very simple things like that, but you put them together, it becomes an issue. I can't imagine any of his previous victims would be suggesting anything other than to immediately recall him. He says, I'm going to commit a crime. He's done the most egregious and serious of crimes, and they still allow him to stay out. Yeah, that, that's the bottom line. That's the key concern that I would have in this case. Uh, the probation service didn't take action. They could have taken it um, unilaterally as well. Um, certainly would have been grounds for recall. Despite Campbell's confession to probation that he wants to rape again, they do nothing to stop him. He begins to meticulously plan an attack. His innocent victim is Lisa Skidmore a 37-year-old nurse who lives in Millcroft, Bilston, just a mile from the hostel Campbell stayed in when he first came out of prison. She loved children, she loved her family. She was very devoted to them. She was a quiet and reserved person. At the same time, she had quite childlike pleasures. She loved Disney. Um, her favorite character was Mickey Mouse. She'd been to Disneyland Paris four times. She had been a nurse for 19 years. She was by then a district nurse who cared for people at, uh, you know, often at the end of their lives um, and was much loved in the community. On November 21st, Campbell begins his preparations. Three days before the murder, he um, stole a ladder and went to Lisa's house and put it against her wall and climbed up and peered through her bedroom window. He didn't do anything at the time he came down, but he hid the ladder. On the evening of November 23rd, Campbell heads out of his hostel to put his plan into action. He switches off his cell phone so his location can't be traced and then collects beer cans and cigarette butts with other people's DNA on them he clearly doesn't want to get caught. He then catches the last bus to Wolverhampton and walks to Bilston. Campbell turned up at Lisa's house uh, quite early in the morning and he retrieved the ladder and he put it up against her bedroom window, which was open. Lisa was off sick from work and she'd been off sick for eight days and, and she was in bed. In a copy of his earlier attacks, he climbs in through the bedroom window. Campbell brutally rapes and assaults Lisa Skidmore in a prolonged attack. He then forces Lisa to wash his DNA off her as he did in his previous attack. Finally, he strangles her and leaves her for dead. At 10 a.m., Lisa's mother, Margaret, arrives to look in on her sick daughter. She went into the house and called Lisa's name, and he punched her around the head and face three or four times and threw her into an armchair. He got a vacuum cord and he wrapped it around her neck and squeezed. She slumped, she fell, and um, she passed out. Campbell plants the beer cans and cigarette butts around the house, hoping the police will think the attacker was someone else. He then um, went upstairs and set fire to Lisa's bedroom. I came down, turned all the gas taps on, and, and he left, thinking that um, Margaret was dead. Margaret came round after 20 minutes, uh, she had cleverly put three fingers, managed to get three fingers under the cord. In the meantime, neighbours arrived at the house, uh, having seen smoke, and uh, got in. And, and, and they, they came to Margaret, but she said, leave me, leave me. See, see to Lisa, see what's happened to Lisa. Tragically, Lisa is found dead. Her body curled up in the fetal position. Campbell initially returns to his hostel, but then goes on the run. Leroy Campbell had fled to his sisters immediately after 
um, the murder and uh, had confessed to her what he'd done. And three days later, he handed himself into police. Leroy Campbell has tragically acted out on his confession, but this time murdered his young victim. Could this escalation from rape to murder have been predicted? And again, we have uh, the burglary, the illegal entry. The execution of the crime appears to be much more prolonged uh, and brutal than anything he's ever done before. Yes. So I would say that the, I mean, the illegal entry, uh, which now is part of his pattern of offending, that is part of the intrusive and violating uh, effect of, of his offending. And the increase in level of brutality may be uh, a reflection of his need to do more to achieve the same level of excitement. And when he was interrupted by Lisa's mom, um, why did he feel the need to inflict such a brutal attack upon her? My uh, speculation is that he is uh, at being interrupted at a point of um, uh, climax of his fantasy. Um, and so he is then taking out his uh, fury uh, on, on the victim's mother. Is it significant that he, he committed so many facial injuries upon a really personal attack on uh, the mom? Uh, because it wasn't a matter of fleeing the scene, uh, rushing away, it was a dedicated attack. Yes, no, I, I think it's very significant. So um, if this was an attempt to, uh, to remove himself from the situation, uh, then he wouldn't have uh, committed an attack in that way. I think this is an extension of uh, the underlying psychological problems that drives his offending. His plan then was to burn down the crime scene. Is there a psychological aspect to that, an, an erasure of the event? Or was it simply just to try and, you know, escape conviction? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the most likely explanation is that he's escaping conviction. But I, in an assessment of someone like this, I certainly would consider whether this is an extension of that overpowering dominance and, and humiliation of his victims. Yeah, and how unusual is it that a sex offender on the run hands himself in, particularly knowing that he was unlikely ever to see the outside of a prison gate again? I'm not surprised he decided to uh, confess and uh, hand himself in because the very fact that he had confided in his probation officer in the first place that he was going to commit an offence indicates that he had made some movement, at least in his understanding and awareness of the threat he posed to society. And it may well be that he felt safer inside. The consequences of this for everybody is that this clearly was a crime that could have been prevented. It could have been, and uh, for sure, if he was recalled uh, at the earliest opportunity, he would have been in prison. There's no denying that he couldn't have committed the offence from his prison cell. Leroy Campbell is back behind bars, but the ramifications of his crime will be felt for years to come as inquests and inquiries try to get to the bottom of why this system failed so badly. Leroy Campbell hands himself into the local police station where he's arrested and charged with Lisa Skidmore's murder. Despite surrendering to police, he keeps the Skidmore family on tenterhooks for months leading up to the trial. Campbell had continued to put the family through hell because he insisted on a second post-mortem. So that meant that they couldn't bury um, Lisa until shortly before the court case. For the months leading up to the trial, Margaret in particular and other witnesses, um, you know, were full of um, dread about it. Campbell is expected to plead not guilty, but on the day of the trial, he changes his mind. Margaret, who, Lisa's mother, who was due to be the chief prosecution witness, um, was then taken aside. And until then, she knew nothing about Campbell's past. Because she was a witness, you know, she couldn't know about that. Um, she was absolutely distraught. Margaret described Campbell as an evil scumbag. Uh, she wanted him to rot in hell. In court, the prosecution outlines the case for the public record. Although he pleads guilty, his defence team offers up one mitigating factor. 
His defense was that he was a paranoid schizophrenic and, um, and, and, and that really was it. Campbell's claim of schizophrenia is a surprise to everyone. In all their years of working with him, probation has never been shown any evidence of mental illness. When the judge passed sentence, he said that despite his mental condition, he um, showed planning in this crime and that he carried through that um, plan with ruthless efficiency. So his mental condition wasn't accepted as uh, an excuse. Leroy Campbell is sentenced to a whole life term, meaning he will never be released. In June 2019, an inquest is held to determine why the system failed the Skidmore family so badly. Key piece of evidence that came out was that there was a breakdown in communication uh, with the agencies involved in looking after Leroy. He basically warned his handlers that he was having these thoughts, but due to miscommunication between the agencies, this was not picked up. The inquest jury found that Campbell clearly presented an increased risk after disclosing his rape fantasies. The jury returned a verdict that there was failings by the police service uh, and the probation service um, that contributed to the death of Lisa Skidmore. Campbell is now back behind bars, but for me, there are two key questions. Could he ever qualify for release again? And could Lisa's life have been saved? So is there any chance that he will ever be released again? Well, he's uh, subject to a life tariff. So um, frankly, the likelihood of him ever being released again is very, very small. Uh, he will be a very old man. He could be considered for uh, release uh, due to his age or ill health, but probably not for any other reason. Adrian, for you, what are the key missed opportunities that might have prevented Lisa Skidmore's murder? I think that the key missed opportunities start with his release from custody at MAPA Level 1. This is what we call the multi-agency public protection arrangements. MAPA Level 1 is the lowest level. He should have been considered at least at Level 2. The second issue that we just cannot get away from is that he confessed his, that, that, that he was harboring thoughts of committing a further sexual offence. We can't get beyond that point. That was a very major missed opportunity. There should have been an urgent response, whatever that response is. Partly there should have been a consideration, should he be recalled? But if he wasn't recalled, then uh, at least there should have been a detailed discussion urgently, immediately, uh, amongst a group of professionals, or well, what are we going to do about this to uh, ensure that we're confident that the risk can be managed in the community? And as I understand it, that didn't happen. If he had been recalled and put back into a Category D prison, so moved back one step, do you think that um, inevitably this was an offender who was never going to be rehabilitated and whatever the circumstances, whenever he was going to be released after that last sentence, he was going to commit again? There was always a possibility that he was going to commit this offence and it was just a matter of when that would happen. Emotionally, viscerally, what, what does this case leave you feeling? Well, I mean, it, it, it leaves me feeling dreadful. I mean, it's a ho horrible case um, to, you know, to, for there to be that level of uh, suffering and those consequences for the families uh, of the victims and the victims themselves. Well, it's clearly been a devastating case. And of course, everybody's heart goes out to this poor victim and the victim's family. Um, a terrible uh, death. And, and for this to happen in our society is distressing for all. A review into Lisa's murder by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Probation found that probation failed in their duty to minimise risks to the public and did not do their job properly. The West Midlands Police said that although they had invested millions in managing parolees, they recognised that those interventions did not prevent an innocent woman from losing her life. It was a big funeral. There was uh, over 300 people there. Balloons were released. Nurses lined the streets in her honor. Two consultants, one, one had flown over from Italy, uh, another came from Wales for the funeral. 
which showed the regard in which she was held. We will never know if Leroy Campbell was a murderer in waiting, but we do know that if the decision had been taken to recall him then and there, then one precious life could have been saved. The authorities have been held to account over those failures, but nothing can bring Lisa back.